Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and thank you, Johannes Laas, for that energetic take on Ode to Joy. I hope no one spilled their coffee. On the occasion of the approaching Europe Day, it is my pleasure to welcome you to this webinar, Europe's Defining Moments. We're broadcasting live from the digital studio of the Culture Hub in Tallinn, and the event is organized by the European Commission representation in Estonia. My name is Johanna Stralla. I'm a journalist working for Estonian Public Broadcasting. Now, in the next 90 minutes, we shall discuss the lessons the EU has learned while wrestling the challenges the COVID crisis has brought. But we will also address possible scenarios the future has in store, both in terms of the economy and our values. Now, allow me to introduce our distinguished speakers, President of the Republic of Estonia, Kersti Kaljulai, joining us from Kadriorg Tallinn. Good morning. Good morning. And the Executive Vice President of the European Commission, Franz Timmermans, joining us from Brussels. Good morning and Good. tere to everyone in Estonia. Oh, tere indeed. Now, uh, though it might seem that I'm standing alone next to this podium in this wonderful spacious venue, I'm by far the only one asking questions today. I'm pleased to say that we've got more than 400 registered participants that are right now live in our virtual conference room. A wave to all of you guys there. Many of you will soon be able to ask your questions. And we're also taking written questions via the Slido application. Just head to slide.do and enter the code hashtag webinar 0805 and you can post your questions there. Now, don't worry if you didn't remember the code. We will have it on display for you when the time is right. But without a further introduction from my side, Let's get going. Now, the first question is for you, President Kaljulaid. Now, you've been rather critical on the initial response of the European Commission uh, when tackling the current crisis. How would you describe the preparedness and perhaps the preliminary panic that we saw? Well, being rather critical is, uh, I would say, too strong way of wording what I said. What I said is that European Union is always uh, pretty much in tune when it concentrates on why it is created and what is its main objective and what we have uh, given European Union the right uh, to do. And uh, this is basically to guarantee our four freedoms. When European Union deals with four freedoms, it's efficient and effective. When the European Union tries to deal with uh, issues for which it is not built up, for example, social security, it's bound to fail. And therefore, people get confused. If the European Union is not able to, uh, to go and buy enough protective gear, then people say it is failing. Uh, when the European Union is not concentrating in guaranteeing four freedoms, then I would say that uh, it is not concentrating on what it should be concentrating. And the initial panic there was, it was quickly over and now the union is functioning as well as it can, of course, because free movement of people obviously is not possible. But free movement of services, I think, will be much freer after this crisis because we know now that services can be offered online much more extensively than we thought before. So the European Union, as each and everybody of us, was not ready for the crisis. Nobody globally could be ready for such a crisis but it has come together. We have come together to overcome the difficulties very quickly. Vice President Timmermans, does the Commission have what it takes to guarantee the four freedoms to keep the borders open and the common market alive? I think we do. I think we, uh, the initial reaction was understandably um, uh, national um, because anything pertaining to health is a national competence. Um, and then member states uh, thought that uh, individually they all had uh, the wisdom uh, to deal with it on their own, but very quickly realized that they need each other to come out of this in a stronger way. I think that, for instance, by helping member states to create green lanes uh, at the border so that we can continue to supply all our citizens with the food they need and the other products we need is uh, um, one of the measures the Commission could take uh, to help us uh, cope with this situation. But, you know, the Commission can only do so much as member states uh, allow us to do. So I think this is something we 
need to look at from a perspective of everybody taking their own responsibility and especially also member states understanding that they need to hang in the, in, into this together. Uh, one of us stumbles, we will all fall and this crisis has only begun. And I think in the uh, mandate of this Commission, in the mandate of this European Parliament, overcoming the effects of uh, the Corona crisis is going to be uh, our main task. And this will be with us for the next four and a half years. President Kaljulaid, how would you characterize the health of the EU today? I mean, recent news from Karlsruhe, I think the German Constitutional Court gave quite a blow to the EU institutions. What does that mean? kind of uh, news actually bring to Europe? I am uh, confident that European Central Bank uh, can justify, if we talk about the subject matter, the proportionality of uh, its measures. On the other hand, the question is, should it clarify, should it do so? I think this is uh, a legal question which I am not qualified to answer and I'm quite sure that many lawyers all over Europe are now thinking about it. Because in principle, uh, one member state cannot uh, take uh, a decision that the European institution needs to explain something or, or uh, I mean, declare how, why it found its measures to be proportionate. So this is a question for the lawyers to sort out. But I would like to remind you, Johannes, that, uh, I mean, European Union is a value-based organization. We have come together because we believe in common values. And these common values deal with our basic freedoms. And if we remember this every day and on every step which we are taking, we will definitely find a way to the better future, supporting each other also through this very difficult crisis. I do hope the lawyers agree with you on that, uh, President. But, Vice President, uh, what, what, what is should your... they agree upon? <laughs> I mean, that, that EU is values, a value based Values, values yes. are enough. <laughs> yeah. But, Vice President Timmermans, uh, how would you characterize the health of the EU these days? Well, I think the, 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 the one thing that threatens us more than anything else um, is what I would call moral hazard uh, a lack of trust. Uh, in each other between member states and between people. Uh, the, the feeling that uh, uh, I should look after my own interests because I can't trust my neighbor. Now, the very, very being of the EU was inspired by uh, the overcoming of virulent nationalism, of scapegoating, of uh, creating enemies within the nation or a, 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 in a, a next country. Um, I think the best solution Europeans have ever found for this recurring uh, um, uh, pandemic of wars that we saw for centuries is the European Union where we say, okay, I can only flourish if you're doing well. I can only do better if you're doing well. This has served um, uh, um, uh, Europe for so many years. And, and you know, um, as somebody who's slightly older than most of the people participating today, I have very, very vivid memories of being in Estonia 30 years ago, literally 30 years ago, when Estonia was fighting for its freedom. And if you, if you look at Estonia today, one of the most modern countries in the European Union, one of the most connected countries globally, a, a country leading in tech, if you had told me 30 years ago that Estonia would be a, a leading member of the European Union and of NATO, I would have you know, advise you to go and see a doctor. Uh, and now it's just a reality and everybody sees it as normal. This is a huge achievement and it's done on the basis of values. And, and your president is one of the persons leading on values in Europe. And I think she's doing an incredible job at that. Well, when you look at the initial reactions, we saw isolationism, we saw protectionism. What can the EU offer, what kind of a recipe can you offer uh, for the heads of state, for the governments in this situation to get over that, to remind again those values that brought us together and that made us stronger? Well, I think, you know, I have some understanding, uh, I have to be honest, uh, with uh, initially a knee-jerk reaction. This is panic, you know, the, the, the COVID crisis was upon us in, in, in the blink of an eye and everybody needed to react to save people from dying and getting very sick. Uh, but then, step by step, uh, we can offer uh, a way out of this crisis that is more efficient if we act together as Europeans than if we do it individually. 
So I think if we can offer a, a prospect that starts from three principles. First, our reaction should be commensurate to the challenge. So if we see that, for instance, there's almost a trillion of investment gap, we should be able to react uh, to bring Europe back in, into a growth situation. Secondly, we need to do it uh, fast. This can't wait because the economic effects will start being felt very soon. And especially after the summer, uh, the, the spectre of mass unemployment will become uh, really looming. And thirdly, we need to do it in a, in a way that is based on solidarity, that those countries that um, suffered more and have less capacity to invest themselves out of this problem get the support of the countries who suffered less and have more capacity uh, to uh, come out of this crisis. Then we will be in line with the European principles and then I think we can show to our citizens that working together delivers better results than trying to do it alone. Solidarity is a great word. I'm just wondering, have we learned the lessons from 2009 uh, when the past economic crisis, the financial crisis, southern European countries felt as if they were left alone? Pre President Kaljulaid, do you feel that uh, the measures taken now on the European level uh, will, like the Italians, the Spaniards, the Greeks, they won't feel left alone? Uh, I would uh, think that uh, even during the last crisis and particularly as we now look back to that crisis and, uh, and its resolution, even southern European countries who needed uh, quick help then uh, must realize that the outcome, not for them, not for anybody in, uh, in Europe, is, is too bad. I mean, we stuck together. We resolved many problems which relate to our euro area. There is still business to finish, but we are better off and better prepared. So if we look back at that crisis and, and final outcomes, I would say that uh, we can actually be encouraged by that experience. And uh, indeed, we should seek to act in solidarity. And if I hear people talking about the investment gap, then uh, sometimes I get worried because um, I've seen a certain uh, feeling that uh, for development only public money can be used. Whereas I deeply believe that uh, public spending should only be limited to creating free market opportunities. And then we should leave it to private sector to uh, build uh, the market and, and act on the market. Because, for example, if we take energy markets in European Union, then... Uh, we need to make sure that uh, there are connections between countries, but then we need to make sure that no country invests public money into production and reserve creation, otherwise the market's ruined for the private investment. And that's the danger. This is our choice now. Smart policy making together with smart investment into market creation or massive public spending to carry out the, uh, the uh, change in the energy sector which we need. Because when the European Union started, based on the values and then supported by the economic principles, which then were well worded in two, uh, two words, coal and steel, then now these two words are data and green energy. So I think we need also in this crisis to make sure that our reaction now when the panic has passed is not limited to, uh, well, trying to reach back to the status quo, which we have, but also trying to reach forward to the new economic opportunities. Vice President Timmermans, when I look at the word Corona bonds, it does bring back memories uh, from the financial crisis. Euro bonds was a much uh, heated uh, debate uh, back then. Now, are we still facing similar political hurdles when, let's say, restarting the European economy these days? And I mean, the country you know best uh, is, well, very critical towards uh, the so-called Corona bonds. Well, yes, I think, I think um, the discussion of yes or no corona bonds has become a bit sterile and is not leading anywhere uh, because some will, be, will remain attached to it and others will remain staunchly opposed to it. Um, what I, Do we what need I fear them? Most, what, I, what I fear most is that uh, we address this crisis in the same way with the same instruments as we addressed the previous crisis. That would be a huge, huge mistake. We need to understand that to get out of this crisis, given the investment gap, given the uh, a huge needs for restructuring that will affect part, large parts of European industry, 
we have to mobilize as much capital as possible, private and public. And this is something that will lead member states uh, to look differently at, for instance, also public debt. And the interesting thing is, if you look at my, the country I know best, um, uh, on the one hand, very critical of corona bonds. On the other hand, very, very willing to invest massively and incur even uh, 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 larger portions of uh, a deficit and larger portions of public debt. So the uh, thinking about debt and public debt and private debt is developing, is evolving. The one thing we need is for us to come together at a European level and to find a compromise to what extent we will need loans and to what extent we will need grants to get out of this crisis. And that's exactly what we're doing uh, right now. There should be a balance between loans and grants that can be acceptable uh, to all member states. We will talk about the economy uh, more thoroughly in, in a few minutes, but let's talk about values. Freedom House uh, recently said Hungary was no longer a democracy. Now, how worried are you about the developments that we see in some countries in Europe when in the shadow of the crisis certain, uh, let's say, powers are consolidated? President Kaljulaid. Well, uh, as I said already, European Union is a value-based organization. It cannot be interest-based in principle because uh, our treaty says each and every one is equal. And we know that if we are in an interest and power-based world, then uh, the small ones will suffer. We have voluntarily agreed to the treaty which says each and every one is equal. Each and every one has their rights. This applies for states, this applies for citizens, this applies for groups among our citizens, this applies for journalists and everybody. European Union cannot exist without these foundations and, uh, and it cannot change. If we start to change this and say we are only an economic uh, cooperation, we are not anymore a value-based union, then I'm afraid that we will lose the grounds of coming to the common decisions relating to our future because the grounds of decision-making is our treaty always has been and will always be. Vice President Timmermans, your take on this? Well, I, I couldn't agree more uh, with President Kalulaid on this. I think she is absolutely spot on. Uh, also, uh, for the reasons she gave, but there are also purely economic reasons. You know, if, if we want the, the internal market to function, if we want our common currency to function, we need to be sure that all the uh, laws we decide in Europe, all the regulations we decide in Europe, are applied in exactly the same way all across the European uh, Union. And we need national parliaments to have the possibility to look into that. And ultimately, we need national judges to be able to uh, be European judge when they judge that. And if we, 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 we have a problem with the rule of law, if judges are no longer independent, if member states can determine by themselves how to interpret EU law, then sooner or later the internal market will break down and the common currency will break down. So we also not just, it's not just about fundamental values for which, you know, your country fought so hard uh, 30 years ago. It's not just for that. It's also because for the very functioning of the European Union, we need to be on the same page in terms of respecting fundamental values. And, you know, uh, just a couple of days after, uh, you know, the freedom of the press uh, day uh, was held, a democracy cannot, cannot survive in uh, a, a, a way that is in line with the rule of law if there are no free media, if the media are, are turned into first uh, state-owned media and then state uh, propaganda-spreading media. Uh, and, and I think we have a challenge here, not just in the EU, but uh, wider in the world, to make sure that uh, our journalists can do their work free and fairly without interference from government. Well, I do thank you for that support, Mr. Timmermans. Um, I don't know about you, but uh, in the past days, I've been eager to check out flights from different airliners to see if there's already something available for Italy or Greece. Now, uh, what is your scenario? How do we uh, keep uh, how do we keep free movement alive this summer uh, in the southern European countries, which heavily rely on tourism? When can we open the borders there, and what will what will take place in the European summer this year? Mr. Timmermans. Oh, well, uh, at the Commission, we're working now on, on a plan to see how we can help 
uh, tourism and the hospitality uh, industry uh, recover. Uh, you need to understand, you know, that the businesses suffering most in Europe are small and medium-sized uh, enterprises. And in the tourism sector, in the hospitality sector, you have micro-enterprises and small enterprises. And, and, and if we don't uh, come to their rescue, if you don't help them recover, then you're looking at mass unemployment uh, and, and huge, huge problems in many member states. Now, the, the, the main issue here is how you organize tourism and uh, combine it with the necessary social distancing. And I think we need to work closely with uh, the, the transport uh, um, industry, we need to work closely with tour operators, and we need to work closely with those uh, countries who are net, net exporters of ter uh, uh, tourism who really need uh, this recovery so that we can get tourism started again and still have social distancing uh, rules applied. Then people can uh, can uh, uh, comfortably um, uh, go on holiday without a uh, higher risk of uh, being uh, affected uh, by the coronavirus. President Kaliolaid, how do you see the state of the European economy, let's say, uh, on Europe Day 2021? Well, I was getting a little bit worried that we are not able to enlarge each other's perspectives, but now luckily this uh, question, well, helps me a lot. I would like to enlarge what uh, Vice President Timmermans said about the uh, rule of law helping also uh, in our economic development. Take uh, the two most important uh, areas of economic development. As I already mentioned, for me, they are data and green economy. If you look at the data, then what you need is for the next round of digitalization for artificial intelligence, you need a clear package of rules, which will make sure that each and every one of us knows who has the right to amass data, who has the right to mine data, how they need to keep data safe and how they need to dispose of it. And also how can, if necessary, authorities verify that this is indeed happening. We need this regulation urgently because otherwise our artificial intelligence in Europe will be less developed than in uh, less democratic regions and countries. And this we don't want, we cannot afford it. So indeed, we need a certain quick development in an area of law at the European level because doing it nationally has absolutely no sense. Data, well, is, is so, uh, so common. And the other area is the same green economy, where I can see as well that rule of law, which would make the market believe that our objective, no emissions by 2050, a huge market distortion in itself, will definitely take place, which will allow then in this set framework to develop new technologies and implement them safely for both citizens, investors, and also for administrations, because finally we are all held responsible both for economic development and for the respect, respect of our people's rights and also for the, uh, for the respect of our businesses' rights. President, Vice President Timmermans, uh, when is the European Commission coming out with a reviewed proposal of the next uh, MFF? Because, sure, you can have regulations, but you also need to have money to uh, get the European economy rolling again. And uh, is the Green Deal still part of it? Well, uh, first question, when will we come out with this soon? Uh, the President uh, von der Leyen is working hard on this with all my colleagues. And uh, I think we will be ready in a matter of weeks uh, to present this uh, to uh, the European Council and the European Parliament. Uh, on um, your second point, um, I believe the Green Deal is the best growth strategy we have for Europe. Now, we were talking earlier about the need to mobilize as much as we can investment capacity to get out of this crisis. But this will be, by uh, definition, a limited uh, capacity because of the economic crisis that now falls. So we have to make sure we put that limited capacity into the 21st century economy, not into the 20th century economy. Because if we do it, put it in the 20th century economy, into fossil fuels and things like that, we will not have the investment capacity to take us into the future. And since we are now going to put an extra burden on the shoulders of our children, we have to have a proposition that is good for them. And the only proposition that is good for them is to deliver a planet that is cleaner, that is more in balance with itself, 
uh, that leads to uh, sustainable energy sources, that leads to a circular economy, that leads to a digital economy uh, uh, for which uh, Estonia is a, a leader. And you know, it's also a question you will have to address in Estonia. I know it's, a, it's not an easy question to address. Where do you want to put your limited investment capacity? Into where you are a leader, the digital economy, or into the services economy, or into fossil fuels. I think I would reconsider that very, very seriously and look for ways out of this that takes Estonia also into the remit of renewable energy. You have huge potential there uh, as well. And I would, would, would really advise you to take that, that seriously and to not sink money into assets that will be frozen in the future. There is no future in coal. There is no long-term future in oil. We need to understand this. But there is a future in wind and in solar and especially in hydrogen. Well, it would be interesting to know if the Prime Minister and the Minister of Economy are with us at this moment and uh, took your suggestions uh, seriously. But I would like to thank our audience uh, who have joined us in our virtual conference room. You've been extremely patient and I would like to now hand over the floor to you for your questions. We have a question from Poland asking about the recovery plan and climate. So I believe we should have a guest via Zoom. Go ahead, you have the floor. Thank you. Uh, Katarzyna Guzek, I'm from uh, Greenpeace Poland. I got a question to uh, Vice President uh, Timmermans. Um, if, you, uh, if you can uh, answer uh, how do you see the plan for a recovery of the EU member states, how it should look like to make sure that it will not be uh, based and focusing on GDP growth? Because as far as we experienced, GDP growth is fueling climate change and biodiversity loss. So uh, I would like to. Um, uh, I would like to. Slide or otsa. Yes. Thank you very much. And before Vice President Timmermans answer this, I will ask a, also a question that arrived via the Slido app. Uh, UN Emissions Gap Report 2019 says emissions must fall 7.6% per, per, per year starting 2020. Due to corona, it might be feasible. How to continue this trend the next year? And another question, looking at the plans the EU member states have for restoring a new normal life, is combating the climate and ecological crisis prioritized enough? These are the questions, all sticking to climate, uh, so you have the floor. Thank you very much. Uh, I honestly believe that the best growth strategy, a long-term growth strategy for the European Union, is to embrace the fight against uh, the climate crisis and moving towards renewable energy. Poland is a case in point. Um, if you look at the um, uh, issues of air quality and uh, uh, biodiversity in Poland, um, you see that uh, people living in cities in Poland are no longer willing to accept that bad air quality. We lose um, 400,000 Europeans prematurely every year. They die prematurely because of bad air quality. To do something about that, we need to get rid of coal. And, you know, if you talk to people who... I'm, I'm a grandson of coal miners. If you talk to people in coal mining regions, they understand this. They know this. The only thing is, how do you give them a perspective in the new economy? And I think there is a perspective. I think, you know, uh, if you look at the, the uptake of, of wind energy in Poland now, it's a huge economic opportunity. If you look at the possibilities of offshore wind also in Poland, in the cooperation, for instance, with Denmark, it's a huge opportunity. Solar, likewise. The services economy, um, uh, the circular economy, uh, uh, Estonia is also leading in this, by the way. So I would, I would not say that we need to get rid of economic growth to be healthy again. I think we need a different sort of economic growth. And in our calculations, there are more jobs to be gotten in renewable energy sectors than in the fossil fuel uh, uh, sector. And this is where uh, we need uh, to head. And in terms of the emissions, we need to commit to climate neutrality by 2050, and then we need to commit to a certain goal by 2030. We are now at the Commission working 
on an impact assessment to know exactly how to get to our 2030 target, which is minus 50 to minus 55 uh, in terms of emissions uh, related to uh, what the emissions were in 1990. We will come out with our uh, impact assessment in September. And once we've done that, this can be translated also in the national plans of governments. Uh, but we really, really need to make sure we continue this reduction of emissions because the corona crisis might have led to reduction of emissions uh, in this year. But if our calculations are correct and we will have economic growth next year up to 6% or even a bit more, then of course emissions will shoot up again if we don't at the same time uh, uh, simulate the growth of sustainable energy. President Kaliolaid, would you also like to contribute on this? Yes, I have to go quite long back now into history when you stated that regulations are fine, but money is better. May I remind you, MFF is just 1% of the European Union combined GDP, 1%. It's much more important to achieve the goals which Vice President Timmermans is, uh, is stating and with which I totally agree. With regulation, take climate. The only thing which we need to do is to convince markets, people, those who have money, those who have ideas, that we are dead serious about saving this planet. The only way to save this planet is that the richest biggest market, which happens to be the European Union, takes the responsibility to say, and then not to have, I mean, uh, little roads aside this objective, to say, we will be clean by 2050. Only this will unleash the development in the wind energy. Only this will unleash the development in the hydrogen. We have to make sure that our market is airtight, no dumping. We have to make sure that th there will be also no greenwashing of methane. This we is a fuel which is fossil, I'm sorry to say. Yes, coal is bad and gas is better, but we need to make sure that we will replace, for example, in Estonia and in the Nordics, the polluting energy production with wind. This is what we need to do. And we need to convince markets by regulation that we are serious about it. Thank you very much, President Kaljulaid. We have people queuing up for more questions. First off, I would like to hand over the floor to Mario Kadastik. We have you on the screen. Go ahead. Thank you. And I think it will follow exactly in the same line as the previous uh, topics discussed. I would namely like to talk about the hydrogen sector that also has quite significant developments here by Tartu University and KBFI, as well as a well-recognized uh, production facility here in Elkogen. Uh, namely, in Estonia, we have our electric electrical supply safety well in a question. And at the same time, we need to also go for the greenhouse gas reductions. And that should also lead, as Mr. Pre uh, as President Kallulaid well put, uh, also to the natural gas uh, reduction in carbonization which means that one of the options would be to combine the hydrogen and the natural gas questions, in the, at least in the near term, by attaching fuel cell technologies to the current gas lines. So instead of burning the gas, we would actually be doing it without the carbon emissions and producing electricity via hydrogen in it. Uh, this is a technology which already exists but is available at low scale. So what is needed is basically scale up of the productions, but this is a situation that the free market cannot currently foster. So to do it, we would need something similar to how it was done for the PV panels, etc. We need some kind of subsidy or other means of investments to boost it to a scale where it becomes self-sustained. And I don't think Estonia can do it alone. So I was going to address the question to Mr. Timmerman to see if this would be something that could be supported at the EC level. Okay, Vice President. Absolutely. I think this is a spot on analysis. I uh, have seen what is happening in Estonia and is very promising. Uh, we will um, uh, prioritize uh, hydrogen uh, as the energy source of the future, also as a storage facility for renewable energy. Um, we will uh, uh, develop projects such as the two times 40 gigawatt uh, production of, uh, uh, by uh, hydrogen. Um, and indeed, it's, it's, it, it's also, it helps us for, uh, in the transition. 
you can blend it. Uh, well, because we start, of course, with gray hydrogen moving to blue hydrogen and then into green hydrogen. That's what we need to do. And then you can blend it with natural gas and step by step take us out of fossil fuel, as the president uh, so correctly said. And hydrogen has a future. Also, our infrastructure. We have huge infrastructure for natural gas in Europe with relatively modest adaptation. Uh, much of this can be um, dual use also for hydrogen, and then in the future it can be used for hydrogen. So I think hydrogen, where Europe leads, is really um, the energy source and the energy storage facility of the future. And if we lead in this, we will also take other parts of the world near to us in the same direction. There are huge plans for hydrogen production, uh, green hydrogen production in Northern Africa, for instance. Uh, I know that in the Gulf states, they're thinking about the post oil um, uh, era and also thinking about hydrogen there. So this is indeed the fuel source of the future. Indeed, we will need investment and we really need the knowledge that is available in Estonia to be on board. here. I would like to add to that, that uh, all we know about the future energy systems is that the production will be much more intermittent with solar and wind, which means that then we need to uh, store this energy which has been produced. And uh, water, hydrogen, other means should all be acceptable for us and should all develop uh, under the market conditions. What I would really like to avoid is that uh, we will choose politically which uh, kind of technologies we will support. I think all we need to decide is we will support everything which is green and let them freely compete, freely develop. For example, here in Estonia, and I, I really appreciate and value what Elkogen is doing. On the other hand, I don't know how well our own and other Eastern European gas grids can tolerate hydrogen. What is the percentage of hydrogen which this gas grid can right now uh, uh, well consist, uh, take in? And this is something indeed where I think we should create a uh, European Union uh, project to come and analyze how much of renovation into the gas grid is needed in order to make all these gradual developments to happen. And, uh, and I am quite sure that this has to be a trans-European project, not an Estonian or Baltic uh, or even Nordic project. Thank you very much. I will now hand the virtual floor to Kristi Reik. You have arrived on our screen, Kristi. Go ahead. Yes, hello to everyone and um, thank you to the speakers for this uh, stimulating discussion. Uh, I would like to broaden the debate and ask about uh, the global dimension of the corona crisis. It is, as we know, a global problem and what we have seen during the crisis is a really painful lack of global leadership. The US uh, is not really any more taking this role of global leadership. China is behaving irresponsibly. Tensions between major powers are growing. And where does this then leave the European Union, which uh, has taken some steps to, to um, forge uh, a more global international response to the crisis? It has pledged some support globally uh, to... to um, a fight with the virus. Uh, it has given some help to neighboring countries in the Eastern Partnership countries in the Western Balkans. Uh, but uh, is, is that enough? And what does the crisis do to the global role of the EU? Uh, it's very uh, much needed. But uh, is there a danger that the EU is becoming more inward looking because of our own problems? And climate, uh, which we were talking about earlier, is one field where uh, it is absolutely necessary to also have a global role because Europe is. Thank you. Thank you very much, Christy. Uh, Vice President, uh, your take on this. Well, I think this is an incredibly important point. Uh, and uh, I would, um, from a European perspective, uh, specifically would want to mention Africa as a continent. It's our sister continent where we will have to have an approach that helps Africa avoid the, the, the worst consequences uh, of um, uh, the corona crisis uh, in combination with helping Africa to tackle things like the locust uh, um, uh, infestation they have and the drought uh, problems they have uh, and their need to 
first of all, get into the energy, uh, into supplying energy to their citizens, but then let's try and make it sustainable energy at the same time. So uh, I could not agree more uh, with um, the idea that this is a global, this needs a global uh, approach. Now, we're being challenged uh, because uh, China is now flexing its muscles more than ever before on the global uh, scene. Um, uh, there is um, a, a tendency in the United States uh, to not be as engaged on the global scene as uh, before. And these two things combined mean that Europe will need to take a greater responsibility for it, not just its own destiny, but also for um, uh, maintaining as far as we can um, the international system based on multilateralism and on rules that apply to everyone. Now, in the, the one area where I believe this is still this still has potential is indeed on climate change. Um, we are preparing now the next COP, which has been postponed, which will take place in Glasgow. And if you see that the world is step by step coming together on this, but we need still to convince the Chinese to go further. But if you also see that with the United States, even though the federal government is not in favor of these developments, we work very closely with cities and, and the states in the United States to make things really move forward. This creates a, a optimism, uh, at least as far as I'm concerned, that we can actually have a real result in, um, in the next COP in Glasgow in terms of uh, our commitments to the Paris uh, Agreement. But let me, let me end where I began. We have to look very closely at what's happening in Africa and take collective responsibility to help Africa avoid the worst now in this crisis. Thank you very much. Uh, President, would you like to comment on yes. this? Yes. Uh, in direct answer to Christy, I would like to say that all deficiencies in all societies are simply enhanced in, uh, in the time of crisis. They are brought out, but they were there before. And we've never been perfect. We've never pretended we are perfect and we never will be perfect. But also all the trends which were going uh, for a better future are also still there. For example, if I take the same example as, as Vice President, African Union has decided, well, slightly postponed because of the corona crisis now, to execute the same four freedoms what we have in Europe. Estonia has a digital memorandum with African Union for digital development, standardization, etc. The tendency of regionalization, of making sure that uh, regions are able to, well, not, uh, not, to, not to incur unnecessary, uh, well, uh, environmental cost to transport really cheap goods. The regionalization was already ongoing too. I mean, if you think about the three-dimensional printing, etc. These are the trends which were ongoing. These are the trends which will all work also for the better future. And for the leadership, well, if you are working on supranational level, like is Vice President Timmermans and, and everybody in the European Commission, then your job is to use the technology and the positive trends to maximize the global well-being, not only the well-being of a particular nation or well-being of a particular country. And they are striving to do so. And I think that what we need in all this so solution is a good, healthy dose of idealism. We need to remember why we do politics and why we do supranational politics to maximize the well-being of human beings globally, if you are at supranational level. At least this is expected from everybody. Thank you very much, President. Now the microphone in our virtual conference room will now be handed to Ivar Raik, who is on the screen. Go ahead, Mr. Raik, you have the floor. Yeah. Thank you very much. First of all, I would like to congratulate everybody uh, on Europe's Day tomorrow. And uh, my question is to uh, uh, Mr. Franz uh, Timmermans first. When next conference on the future of Europe will start, promised by Ursula von der Leyen uh, during his, her speech uh, in the European Parliament, and how civil society and European institutions should work there as equal partners, or promised uh, by um, Leyen. And the, which are the main ideas to this conference? Federal Europe, as described by uh, Verhofstadt, I have uh, his last book printed in America, or by 
Ivan Krastev, who said that uh, uh, there is no future for federal Europe anymore after this uh, crisis, that the new model of intergovernmental cooperation should be worked out. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ivar. We have a very similar question that arrived uh, via Slido. I will just read that out loud. Uh, the question is as follows. Do you think that the coronavirus crisis will give an impulse to the conference on the future of Europe? Vice President, you have two questions. You have the floor. Yes. Well, um, my colleague, uh, Vice President Schuitza, uh, in, in dialogue with uh, the European Parliament and um, uh, the uh, European Council, or the, uh, the Council of Ministers, is looking into the planning of the, um, of the Conference on the Future of Europe. And, uh, you know, um, I, I was a member of the European Convention. I can tell you, if, if we don't succeed in engaging with larger parts of the population, this will, again, be an exercise. Uh, uh, you know, if we then have a conference uh, along the old lines, uh, I can assure you that I will know every single participant and every single contribution uh, because it's always the same people doing that. And that would be a mistake. So uh, my colleague Schuitza is working on it to make sure that this uh, leads to a broad, broad participation in society. But having said that, frankly, I believe that the only way we can get the attention of uh, the European population, and we can get support for the idea uh, and the idealism of the European Union is if we deliver results on those issues where nation states can no longer uh, act on their own, uh, where they need the European dimension. And this is if we can show that we have a way forward out of this crisis based on solidarity, that we will leave no one behind, uh, not the weakest people in our societies, nor the weakest countries in our union. And if we can show that we have an answer uh, to the climate crisis, if we can show that there is a future for a sustainable economy, if we can show that Europe can play a global role to avoid new wars uh, coming, to avoid uh, parts of the world uh, sliding into misery, I think that is the strongest, the strongest way in which we can create support for the European project. I honestly do not believe in the vision of Guy Verhofstadt that Europe will eventually develop into sort of the United States of Europe. I don't think that is in the nature of who we are as Europeans. We, the European construction will, in its nature, be hybrid. We will share some competences in a supranational level, at the uh, European level. Other competences will stay in the hands of the member states. And, you know, I honestly believe, strongly believe that a strong Europe needs strong uh, uh, member states with a strong sense of identity. Because, you know, if you are if you are sure of your own identity, if you feel comfortable with your own identity, you don't fear anybody else. You don't need to scapegoat anybody else. You don't need to become a virulent nationalist hating others just to feel better. If you're assured about your own identity and your own destiny, you're open to others, you're curious about others, and you don't fear others. That is how I would like to see the European Union of the future. President Kaljulaid, your vision for the future. Uh, yeah, I, mean, I think I would like to react to Ivar Reich's question and also to Guy Verhofstadt's position on federal Europe. I mean, they are on opposite positions, but in my mind, they are on totally unnecessary positions because taxonomy is only needed if you have a high number of similar entities which you somehow need to compare and classify. But you don't need taxonomy if you're talking about unique entity, and European Union is unique. Uh, so we should actually concentrate on, uh, on developments which we need and not how we classify how the Union thereafter looks from some theoretical viewpoint. If you look at our problems in the Union, they are common. Take it, uh, be it climate, be it data, be it migration, whatever. The problems are common, even our wish uh, to resolve global problems is common in the European Union. For that, the rational thing is to have a set of regulations and agreements by which we come together in a set place uh, set people who are supposed to participate, prime ministers, other ministers, a set of rules by which we come to conclusion and a way to implement our conclusions and decisions. And if somebody can tell me how we could individually better achieve these things than 
according to the EU and the EU treaty, then let me know. But I have not yet heard any, at least any rational ideas. Take, for example, how we globally try to solve the climate issues or the human rights issues. We don't have a set of rules by which we do it, and we don't have implementation bodies, and that is why we globally fail. And of course, that will always be this way, because it would be too much to expect to be managed. But at least on our own continent, we have managed to come together with an agreement on how we do things on our continent. And this simply makes sense, call it math, call it physics, call it, well, law of nature even, if you wish. This is how it is. And that's why European Union has a future. Well, thank you very much for those bold uh, answers and statements, both uh, of you. We now have Siria Potisab joining us in our virtual conference room. Siria, go ahead, you have the floor. Yeah, hello for everybody. And first of all, I thank you all for uh, participating. Uh, I have a question to Mr. Dimmermans. I am a manager of Estonian Food uh, Industry Association. And I have a specific question from the food industry, some of which are already struggling to survive. Uh, what concrete kind of supports can an Estonian, who mostly SMEs, food company expect from the European Commission in recovering from the COVID-19 crisis? Maybe it's a too concrete the question, but I'd like to hear the answer. Thank you. Thank you very much, Syria. Go ahead, Vice President. Well, I think, you know, look, look at this crisis. Um, uh, European agriculture and the food industry has been able to feed uh, all Europeans uh, during this crisis. And I think, I think they should be recognized as uh, part of those heroes who are helping us uh, to come through this crisis. Now, I think, one of the effects of this crisis is that Europeans will be much more uh, focused on their health, on their consumption uh, uh, habits, especially on their eating habits, and they will want to look for healthier food. Uh, they will want, they will have more attention for locally produced uh, food. They will want to know how food is produced and where uh, uh, the elements uh, come from. And I see this as an incredible opportunity for the food industry. But in the short term, it is clear that in certain sectors, especially the hospitality sector, um, uh, there are serious, serious problems we need to we need to address uh, and get the economy going as soon as possible. Concretely, uh, the Commission will come out uh, with our farm to fork and our biodiversity strategy on the 20th uh, of this month. And there you will see elements to make sure that we um, sort of reconnect uh, Europeans with healthy lifestyles, with healthy food products, that we help farmers um, produce closer to market uh, with less pesticides, with less negative effects on our biodiversity. And I honestly believe that by supporting these developments, also concretely in reorienting parts of our common agriculture policy towards that, we can create a new relationship between European citizens and what they eat, which is to the profit of the food industry, where, where so many people are working and, and now are, are, are threatened of being unemployed. And we have an urgent, urgent need to support them to get out of this crisis. President Kaljulaid, would you also like to comment this? Yes, first of all, I would like to remind us all that common agricultural policy in the European Union is the biggest support for each and every farmer, particularly in smaller member states with smaller budgets, because this guarantees that the uh, companies are treated equally. Nobody is able to outpay the other governments in order to create advantages for production, for selling for their own companies. This is, I believe, a big help for companies in Estonia and elsewhere, but uh, I think we should never forget that. Second, in this crisis we have seen how diversity of production has come together with diversity of demand, because all of a sudden many people more, instead of going to a huge shopping mall, are shopping online, and if you shop online then you have access to a far more diverse uh, uh, market. And this is something which definitely will survive into the future. Question is, how will the big uh, distribution chains come into this game? Because right now we see it also in Estonia and I'm sure everywhere else in Europe, rather inefficient uh, 
delivery change have uh, actually come up to serve people with the diversity of production from uh, Estonian farmers and, and not only Estonian farmers, but the others as well. Now, how will the big distribution change come into matching this demand? Because in principle, it's quite easy to imagine that a small farmer delivers its produce to a big consumer chain, which will only take upon itself the responsibility to deliver it at the other end of its big tube to the customer. And I'm quite sure that since new digital means as well have been used now in this crisis to match this diversity of production with diversity of demand, that these things will continue in the future and also help the small farmer. Short term, it is of course a very hard time for all who are producing uh, locally or producing for bigger markets. European Union is keeping the, the goods market open, which is a good thing. On the other hand, of course, all consumers have come a little, gone a little bit nationalistic and patriotic, and this is also, I believe, understandable. But this queue is not enough to, uh, or, or not too big to, uh, to create uh, much disturbances in the, in the long perspective. Well, Siri, I hope you got an answer for your very concrete question. I would like to thank everyone who's participated so far. We still have about 35 minutes until the end of today's webinar. Let me just um, put up a quick reminder uh, of the Slido code you need to enter. So first of all, head uh, to slide.do and when you get there, just enter the code hashtag webinar 0805 where you can post your question. And we've received many questions. Let's just take a next one. Uh, so how can we support families and children in the post-epidemic society in order to cope with everyday life and solve the mental health problems of children? Uh, let's just take uh, that answer from Vice President Franz Timmermans. Well, I think, you know, if... if, if um I, at the core of the issue is is uh, what uh, President Kalulite said earlier, uh, our values, uh, our values, uh, which also uh, mean that we um, stand ready to help those who are most vulnerable, uh, um, who in this crisis uh, are, um, are under threat. Um, we see across the European Union a huge increase of domestic violence in uh, this crisis and times of social distancing. Um, and, you know, that's why international treaties that protect the weaker, that protect the vulnerable, uh, need to be adopted across uh, the European Union. Uh, for instance, the Istanbul Convention that protects uh, women against violence uh, should be adopted across the European Union and by the EU uh, itself. Uh, the healthcare, of course, uh, let me be very clear on that. It's a national competence, uh, uh, but our citizens don't care whether the competence is national or European. They want us to do something about this. And I believe that resilient healthcare systems is something that uh, our citizens will demand after this crisis. These are the people that pulled us through. And the financing of healthcare systems has always been a challenge and has con continued to be a challenge. But I think in prioritizing, European citizens will demand of their national authorities that they make sure that doctors and nurses are better paid, are better looked after, are better educated. And that's the best way we can serve also um, uh, those who are most vulnerable and need uh, medical and other attention at this stage. President Kallioraid, I suppose you have a strong opinion on this. Yeah, indeed, I think that in this crisis, the social market economy model practiced by the European countries because its citizens demand it uh, has proven its value in the crisis. We have vast healthcare systems which can react in a more or less uniform way. We have also a vast uh, network of uh, social security. Albeit, it's of course falling uh, short if you look at the at the uh, uh, magnitude of the problem. But uh, we are much better equipped than any other region globally. Social market economy probably is the best way forward into the society, which will also help families and children. For the rest, the honest answer is that we will support and help all over Europe our families and our children according to national preferences and according to the elected government's political tastes. And of course, all these reactions must uh, remain in the realms of, uh, of, uh, of the Istanbul Convention, European Treaty, part of which is also uh, the acceptance of universal human rights, etc. But nevertheless, there will be considerable differences all over the Europe. And this depends on the political color 
of each and every government. And this is how we, the citizens of Europe, have wanted it to be. Redistributional policies are the realm of national governments. You can never blame European Union if you are not happy with these policies. And you can, of course, go to the ballot box next time and think more concretely about which ideologies you are ready to support. Because in the crisis, politicians react according to their ideology, not according to how many euros exactly somebody promised in additional child support, additional pension, etc. This is, I think, a, uh, a lesson which we, we must remember also from this crisis. You cannot blame a politician for acting out according to their political beliefs in this crisis. Of course, they have to remain in the realms of treaty, constitutions, etc. But otherwise, there is considerable room for manoeuvre and we have to accept it. So we've covered energy, uh, we've covered food, uh, we talked about social aspects of the crisis. We haven't covered culture yet, and I'm glad that the next uh, question from Slido will exactly do that. Tartu will be the European capital of culture in 2024. Now, what role does, in your opinion, culture play in reconstructing unity, cooperation and trust in a post-COVID-19 Europe, Vice President Timmermans? Well, you know, culture, culture is, at the end of the day, a reflection on who we are. So culture is about representing the human condition. Uh, and if uh, culture reflects our human condition, it reflects our uh, most inner beliefs, it reflects who we are culturally, where we belong, uh, etc., etc. And I believe um, if we want to avoid the recurrence in Europe of people being afraid of each other, of people hating each other, and then of people bashing their heads at, again, uh, uh, like uh, we used to do for centuries and centuries, cultural will play a crucial role. If you know your culture, it gives you self-confidence. And if you have that self-confidence, you become curious about other cultures. And the cultural richness of Europe is what makes us strong. Uh, being curious about somebody else avoids you becoming afraid of somebody else, because then you can learn, you can see the differences. And by the way, you know, the only way to discover who you are is to be confronted with someone who's not like you. You know, if you ask a fish to define water, the fish will not be able to do that. But take the fish out of the water for a few seconds and the fish will damn well know what water is because it needs it. And that's how I see culture. A co confrontation with other cultures helps us better understand who we are, makes us more self-confident and makes us less afraid of what is different. Now, President Kaljulaid, I know you've been uh, taking part in a few virtual concerts. Do you miss going to the theatre? Yes, I do. But uh, I mean, coming from an on rancher like me, but I mean, seriously, culture is the one element of our societies which allows us to understand our society where the statistical board cannot help you to understand it. Thank you very much. I do believe we have our next speaker ready, holding on to the microphone and eager to ask uh, the question from Zoom. Hello, sir. You have the floor. Hello, uh, I'm from Fridays for Future Poland. I have a question to Vice President Franz Timmermans. Uh, how will you guarantee that the European Union funds and state aid will not grant the fossil fuel and other products in businesses, for example, airlines or car industry? Thank you. All right, Vice President, you have the floor. Well, I wish I could give you guarantees because most, as the President said earlier, most of the money will be uh, allocated nationally and spent nationally. Uh, the only thing we can do is try and convince member states that sinking all that money into the 20th century uh, economy is going to weaken their potential efforts to move their society and their economy into the 21st uh, century. So we have to be extremely, extremely careful. And I hope that when we define our climate neutrality goal 2050 and our goals for 2030, we can then stimulate member states to translate that into concrete steps to get to minus 50 to minus 55 uh, by 2030. And that's only 10 years from now. So that would mean very concrete steps. So I hope that we can sort of um, uh, discipline all member states to stay on the same roadmap towards this uh, climate neutral uh, future. 
Um, it, it's encouraging that the European Council uh, uh, globally agreed to this. Uh, the country you are from had some reservations, but we're working uh, with uh, Poland to solve these issues. Uh, and, you know, not just your movement, but general the public in Poland, the citizens of Poland demand this. Nobody in Poland wants to live in uh, this uh, environment where the air quality is so bad that too many people uh, become ill and die prematurely. So I am confident that we can collectively convince everyone to move in the same direction. But let me just end on, on a comment that, that, that was, I was inspired uh, by President Kalulite when she said, people act upon their ideology. And of course, there are people who, uh, for ideological reason, want to close their eyes and close their minds to the reality of the climate crisis and just pretend it isn't there. And beware of politicians who um, uh, deny uh, scientific realities, who deny uh, what is evident to a large majority of the population, namely that we are in a climate crisis and we need to address that with great urgency. So we do actually have a follow-up question for Vice President Timmermans. When you said there are more jobs in the renewable energy sector than in the fossil energy sector, then the person asking or comments saying yes, but asks, how do you bring the transition period until reaching this? And another question uh, from Slido. EU claims emissions have reduced 40% since 1990, mostly due to offshoring and importing back into EU by trade. Now, should the emissions not be measured by should emissions not be measured by destination? Um, uh, first of all, let, let me be very clear. This is a global issue and all, only if we, uh, we can't offshore our responsibility. That's impossible. Uh, so we need to have global um, uh, agreements. That's why we have uh, the COP uh, in Glasgow next year and we hope to convince um, uh, all signatories of the Paris Agreement to commit to climate neutrality uh, somewhere by the middle of uh, this uh, century. Uh, on uh, uh, the um, and now I've forgotten the first uh, question. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I will repeat sorry, uh, the first question. Uh, how to bridge that transition period until right. reaching yes. this situation that the green energy sector that has more is, than the fossil? That that is such a pertinent question. We are in an industrial revolution. In every industrial revolution so far. It's not the starting position that's most painful. It's not the end position that's most painful because that's always much better than the starting position. It's the transition that is painful. Because if, if, if we are true to our principle of living in a social market economy, we have to be also true in helping people make that transition. That means reschooling. That means uh, uh, lowering, uh, lowering the complexity of working in the IT sector, for instance. I've been talking to the big IT companies about this. It's not just about giving people more skills so that they can work for you. It's also your uh, uh, duty to make your work less complex, to let IT work to make things easier. Um, so in this transition, some regions, especially uh, where there are still coal mines, there's about 30 of them uh, left in Europe, will have a harder job uh, making the transition than other regions. That's why European solidarity should kick in. That's why we need a just transition fund to make sure that these regions are assisted in making that transition. And let me just say very briefly from a personal experience, um, um, the region I'm from, uh, the coal mines were closed half a century ago. The last coal mines were closed half a century uh, ago. Um, and still the region is suffering today because not enough was done to help the, the transition. So I know full well that um, if you go from a, 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 an economic monoculture that has no future into the future, you have to assist those regions to make those steps. That's why we need a substantial just transition fund at the European level to make this happen. Again, the transition is the difficult part. Not the start, not the end, but the transition. President Kaliolait, would you like to elaborate on this? Yeah, I was very happy for this question from Poland, because in fact, uh, if you need to convince people that uh, we need to go green, then uh, it's easy for convincing governments. From one side, indeed, we all must collectively convince each other that we are not uh, going uh, 
to give up on our main objective, which is climate neutrality 2050, which already gives a clear perspective to the investment which you would do into the yesterday's economy. And the second thing is, if the citizen demand supports the politician's ambition to be part of the green change, then the politicians will do so. It's that simple, to be honest. Now, what comes to transition and transition costs? First, there are not each and everybody who now works in coal or in Estonian case in oil shale sector who needs to radically relearn. A cockpit of a modern oil shale uh, fueled uh, power plant looks pretty much the same as we look a cockpit of handling the distributed energy production from windmills and all these things. These are engineers which we need in one case and also in the uh, in the next case. These are the same, I mean, information and knowledge which these people must have in order to run these energy systems. Then there are those like miners who probably will need to reorient what they are doing. And for that, the best thing probably is when we are helping people to move to other sectors, initially they will lose in productivity. Initially their salaries will therefore be lower. And we could even consider temporary in-job benefits until people reach the good productivity level to be able to regain their earning capacity in new sectors. And if you think of Estonia now, then before this crisis, and I'm quite sure that this will not change, the best place to create new, fashionable, modern, productive uh, industry has been the same region where we also have our uh, oil shale uh, fired power plants. So I'm hopeful for quick transition. Thank you very much. Uh, we've received a lot of questions on energy and climate, but let's shift to a more philosophical approach. There is a question on Slido asking, is there a lack of solidarity among the members of the EU? And why is this happening? I don't know. Vice President Timmermans, do you? Well, you know, let, let's look at the, what is what is solidarity. Solidarity is not altruism. Solidarity is acting in the collective good with a core of enlightened self-interest. So you need to be, you, if you appeal to the solidarity of people, you need to be sure that they understand that it's in their interest to show this solidarity as well. And there I think is, is the problem uh, today in Europe. There is a lack of understanding that in this crisis, if we don't hang in there together, if we don't find collective solutions, we will not get out of this, none of us. And so the idea is, when you say, well, we don't like uh, the attitude of that country, we don't like the policies of that country, they're on their own. They should take care of their own problems, we'll take care of our problems. If you think that is going to work, you are completely misguided. And I, I, I wish, my, my big wish is that uh, politicians, but also businesses who know this even better than politicians, and actors in civil society would take the responsibility and go to the citizens and tell them this, look, when we are acting together as Europeans, we're doing it in your ultimate interest. Even though you believe you're strong enough to do everything on your own, sadly you're not. We are too interconnected on a continental scale to think that individual member states can take care of this on their own. And I believe if this, if this notion grindingly gets more and more understood in our society, I think solidarity will not be a challenge anymore because people will understand we need each other to get out of this crisis. So we have a window of opportunity now to make this clear. We have a window of opportunity in the coming weeks to bring European nations together. And let me not, I don't want to sound too pessimistic, but if we fail, the consequences of this are going to be monumental. The illusion to think that going it alone is fine and everything else will stay the same and the currency will stay and the internal market will stay, that's an illusion. If we fail our solidarity test now, we will see step by step unraveling of things we uh, cherish, such as the internal market, such as the values we share, such as ultimately even potentially our common currency. So there is a lot at stake and the revival of solidarity is an essential element for us to come out of this crisis stronger. President Kaljulaid, how do you see Europe? Is there a lack of solidarity? 
I think we saw it uh, only two months ago how we couldn't go it alone and how we couldn't tolerate it even for a week of going each and every one their own way. I think we should learn the lesson and I'm quite sure we have learned the lesson and we will do everything in order to make sure that uh, our European freedoms are fully re-delivered to us and uh, that our uh, well, economies can grow based on that, our uh, young people can thrive based on Erasmus and uh, Erasmus Plus. All these elements of the Union, Schengen, Euro, I mean, we had, we had a chance to feel how it, how it was when it all didn't exist. I mean, when you couldn't cross the borders, when, uh, I mean, trade couldn't go freely from one country to another. Milk prices in Estonia dropped 30% uh, because the markets down south were closed. I mean, it's, it's so obvious to each and everyone that uh, it, it's even weird to think that uh, we might not learn the lesson. I mean, I am always optimistic about uh, the humankind's ability to learn. And, uh, and yes, indeed, going ahead, also making new errors, erring into the, into the closed ways and so on, so on. But materially, I'm quite sure that we, we, we've got the message. Well, thank you very much. Uh, because we have 15 minutes to go until the end of our wonderful discussion, I'm going to group uh, the next two questions. The first is a question about identity. What would you do to create a bigger sense of European citizenship? And do you believe this is necessary to promote EU values all over the continent? First question about European citizenship. And the second one, a bold question. Has Europe wasted an opportunity of rising as a superpower after the crisis? Vice President Timmermans, go ahead. <laughs> well, I think, I, I think our goal is to contribute to a re-establishment of the multilateral international system. I think our goal is to make sure the United Nations can play the role it was intended to play. Uh, I think it is not our goal to try and be a rival superpower uh, next to uh, China or the United States. Uh, that is a form of rivalry we can do without. I think the strength of Europe is in its attractiveness, in its uh, societal and social models. I think there is, um, you know, the Corona crisis has proven this again, that uh, compare us to other parts of the world, uh, our models uh, of uh, solidarity, uh, I think, prove stronger and more resilient than other models. And at least uh, we don't um, uh, we don't create uh, the social havoc that is happening elsewhere because of this. And this appeal is the strongest appeal we have as Euro Europeans. And this, I think, with all the cultural linguistic uh, uh, differences we have in Europe, I think if you look at the values we share, that comes down to a form of European citizenship. I think every, uh, by and large, every European wants us to live in a society where when you're old, you're taken care of, you don't uh, slide into poverty, where you have access to education on the basis of your talents, not on the basis of the money of your parents, where if you uh, are unemployed, there is a safety net that prevents you from sliding into poverty. Uh, when if you're ill, you have access to medical care on the basis of uh, fair insurance and that this does not depend on uh, the uh, money uh, you have. Uh, you know, all these things combined are uniquely European. And if we see at the, uh, in Ukraine, for instance, people waving that beautiful blue flag with yellow stars that you can see behind President Kalbulite, they don't do that because they want to have access to the common agricultural policy or structural funds. They do that because they believe in European values. They see these values as their right to a European citizenship. And we should be more proud of that. We should be promoting that more. And we should see a lot of future in that for our children and grandchildren. Thank you very much. President Kaljulaid, would you miss the superpower aspect of Europe? <laughs> Frankly speaking, uh, if I have one wish towards the uh, new European uh, Commission uh, and uh, the upcoming uh, five years, then this is the willingness to be more open towards our Eastern partners, uh, particularly indeed Ukraine, but there are others. 
those Eastern partners who see their future as close as possible to the European Union, uh, those countries in the Balkans who see their future within the European Union, and I deeply believe that we should also give Ukraine and Georgia, provided they reform, provided they resemble us uh, in the application of universal human rights and, and our democratic values, we should give them also a chance to be part of our family. If this is an ambition of a superpower, yes, then uh, I wish this commission superpower. <laughs> so uh, we have about 10 minutes to go. Um, let me just ask uh, this question. What kind of an outcome do you expect for the end of the crisis? Is the EU and what it represents in danger. Now, I know it sounds a bit fatal, but the person from uh, using Slido asked this, so Vice President Timmermans, what's your take on this? Well, let's be, let's be brutally honest about this. Anything that uh, is made by humankind can be unmade by humankind, especially political constructs like uh, the European Union. So there is no guarantee that the European Union uh, will survive uh, any crisis. Uh, and, and already in previous crises, we came close to a very serious damage to the European Union. And especially if ideologies based on violent nationalism, based on this um, um, idea of an omnipotent national sovereignty, which in fact in history never ever existed, but this illusion that on our own, uh, ethnically clean, uh, we could prevail is the biggest threat to the European Union. Because the European Union is not a market. It's not a currency. These are only tools. The European Union is a way for Europeans to overcome the darkest angels in their history. And the darkest angels in our history is that we thought we could prevail by dominating other Europeans. And everybody's tried and everybody's failed and we have millions and millions of deaths uh, to prove that. So let's not forget that if we unravel this project, which is unique in our history, we unravel more than a market or a currency. We unravel the possibility of Europeans to overcome the darkest parts of our history and to act together where we depend on each other so much in a globalized world where, you know, only the scale of the European Union can help us make a, an impact on the choices that will be made about the future of the world. President Kaljulajt. Yeah, as I said, for me, EU uh, makes rational sense, but I do admit that uh, in 21st century, there is quite a lot of irrationality in, uh, in policy making, And I think this is playing with the fire, like was playing with the fire, blaming Brussels for every failure, even if you were yourself at home responsible for that. I thought we have learned that lesson and, and I do still hope that we have learned that lesson and that rationality also prevails. Rationality based on our common values, knowing that indeed power politics cannot bring but trouble. This should keep the European Union afloat. Will it be this way? Well, that depends on the, uh, on the proportions of rationality and irrationality in our policy making. I'm a patriot of Estonia and coming from a small country, really small country, of course for us rule-based rules -based world order is, is, is extremely important, otherwise we cannot exist. And the European Union is, is one of these elements of rules-based world order, so uh, I would do everything to uh, sustain, support and help develop the Union. Well, talking about power politics and the EU's global position, um, I'm curious uh, to know, is the EU taking a different strategy towards China, something that we see Washington uh, playing out uh, dramatically, Franz Timmermans? Um, I'm from a country that is exactly as big as Estonia. Uh, we only have 10 times more people living there, but in size, we're exactly as big. So I'm also from a, from a, small, from a small country. Um, you know, it was only a matter of time that China's economic 
uh, power will be translated in its wish to have a global footprint and to exert its power on the global scale. It's only a matter of time. That what, that's when, what happens when you build up economic power. And we have to be realistic about that. And I think the European Council, in how it dealt with China over the last year, has developed a high degree of realism. So not naive about what China is, is doing, but not aggressive in creating a, a, a controversy with China that is defeating for everyone. So we need to engage with China, but on the basis of our values, we need to say exactly where we think um, the limits are of what can be done. We need to stand up for our values, because ultimately these values will also be something the emerging Chinese middle class will want for, it, for itself. So we have a strong proposition there, but we have to be very, very clear also where we act I feel a strong resp European responsibility, for instance, for the developments in Africa. And I say we need to build up a partnership with Africa, which is of a much higher quality than what China is doing in Africa, because that will be more attractive for African leaders than what China is now proposing. So I, I, I'm, I'm absolutely not naive uh, about what China is doing, but I think it would be um, unwise and wrong to create sort of a Cold War atmosphere between the European Union and China. There's no need for that. We need to, with China, engage to strengthen the multilateral system uh, uh, once again. And I'm sure that at some point, uh, the other global player whose values are very close to ours, the United States, will come back to this multilateral uh, system and assist us in making sure that our values, the ones we also share with the Americans, prevail on a global scale. President Kaliolai, do you think the EU should take a tougher stance on China or, let's say, even go further in developing the economic ties? Europe has actually a system in place which makes sure that nobody can dominate Europe uh, and European markets. Uh, this is called procurement regulation and competition ruling of the European Union. So uh, wherever capital comes from, it has to abide by the rules. And uh, this way, Europe is already protected from the economic might and power of China. And if needed, we need to expand uh, these rules into reaching the technology, transparency of technology and keeping the data safe, which, uh, which is where I started this discussion today. So rationally and, and reasonably, we can, of course, uh, talk to China, trade with China, uh, being adamant that our rules, uh, which mean each and everybody is treated equally, applies. And this way, Europe is safe. We have three minutes, ladies and gentlemen, until the end of this discussion. And I would not want to keep you any longer. You've been very patient and it has been a wonderful discussion, at least looking from here. So I would pose one last question and ask for your short answers. There are. I think two competing uh, visions, uh, one saying that everything will change after the COVID crisis, societies will transform, the economy will change, nothing will be like it was before. And then there's another kind of an approach which will say, come on, market-based economy, capitalism, democracy, we will soon reach exactly the same society, the same habits we had before the crisis. In which of those two uh, visions do you believe in? And let's start uh, with President Kaljulaid. I'm of the school which believes that this crisis only brought out existing both positive and negative trends more vividly. And our job now is to is enhance and, and promote the positive trends to make indeed our economies change and adapt uh, quicker for the future namely going green, namely being more data-oriented and data-based. And of course, try to then make sure that we are able to control the negatives, uh, which also have been brought out by, uh, by this crisis. So definitely this crisis is for stock-taking, uh, but uh, I know that economy is always flexible. The question is, will the political class be as flexible? Our people, well, our people are always supporting us making sure that we maximize uh, the, the, the most important political goal that can have, ever be the well-being of each and everyone. Vice President Timmermans, will we wake up in a different world after COVID uh, has, uh, let's say, left us hopefully one day? Well, the, the COVID will change our world in, in many ways. But as the president said, we were already in the middle of an industrial revolution before COVID. Uh, we were already faced with an existential crisis, which is the climate crisis before COVID. And both the Industrial Revolution 
and the climate crisis are exacerbated uh, by the COVID crisis because the COVID crisis limits our capacity to invest uh, and to transform. So um, we will have to have even more focus on the transformation of our society into a sustainable society. We will have to even more pool our efforts at the European level, even more invest into international negotiations to get the world to come along with this. So um, this COVID crisis will focus our attention even more on the need to transform, will limit our capacity to act. So we need to use the capacity we have entirely to take our society and our economy into the 21st century and avoid investing in the 20th century economy, in 20th century systems, which are going to be obsolete anyway, five to 10 years down the road because of the industrial revolution. So I think it just focuses the minds. It makes our activity, our actions even more urgent than before. That's the only way we will get out of this in a way that is consistent with the values our citizens believe in. Vice President Timmermans, President Kersti Kaljulait, thank you so much for joining us for this webinar. It was very interesting looking from here and I do hope for all of you ladies and gentlemen who have been following us via Zoom or web streams all across the globe. Thank you for being with us. Have a great European day tomorrow. I hope to see you again soon.